Hi everyone, in this short tutorial we're going to take a look at using Dynamo to automate the joining of in situ concrete elements. We'll also take a look at a Python script to automate the switch join order. For those of you that are not sure about joining, if we go to the modify ribbon up here, you can see that we've got this join command over here. And in this example, we can go to join and we have the option of singly joining elements. So I could pick this slab here and this column or I could enable multiple join, in which case I can pick this slab and then use a crossing window to go ahead and join all of those elements. Now that's okay if you've only got a few elements to join, but of course here you can see that we have quite a few elements to join. Once the elements are joined, you can also switch the join order. So for example, if I joined the columns to the floor slab, the floor slab would always take priority, in which case the columns would all be split at the floor level. Now that might be my intention, or my intention may be to have a continuous column that actually punches through all of the slabs. So let's now take a look at the Dynamo script that's going to allow us to build this. Now in this particular tutorial we're going to build up the Dynamo script live so we can talk through exactly what's going on. So let's begin by starting Dynamo. So we'll go to the Manage ribbon and select Dynamo. In this example here I'm using Revit 2022 and we have some updated Dynamo nodes which I'll show you throughout this tutorial. Okay, so Dynamo is now launched. We'll begin by starting a new script. So what we want to do first is be able to collect all of our structural columns. So to do this, we'll open up the Revit shelf. We'll go to Selection. And under Selection here, we want to get all elements of a category. And the category we want are structural columns. So here we can go down to our list. I'll just start to type in the word structural, just a shortcut to the structural elements here and we want structural columns. So of course, by wiring these two nodes together, you can now see that we've collected all of our columns. We'll do a similar thing for our floor slabs. Now, I can just simply make a selection of these two nodes, hold down my control key, and then drag to make a copy. And in this case, I want to get floors. Now, obviously we could use this script for other structured elements just simply by changing the categories here. OK, so you can now see I've collected all of the floors. Now, what we want to do here is make sure that we're only selecting elements that have an in situ concrete material. So to implement this, if we take a look at a column, for example, and this is just an out of the box column that ships with Revit, you can see here that the structural material is a instance property. So what I'm going to do here is use Dynamo to grab the information from this particular instance property. And if it contains the word in situ, then it's good. If we look at the floor slab, it's slightly different because the instance properties here don't show our material. However, if I go to the type properties, which are uh, selected by uh, choosing edit type, you can see here that the structural material again is displayed here. It's read only, but it doesn't matter. We just want to be able to read that and see if it contains the word in situ or the phrase in situ. Okay, so back into Dynamo then. Let's begin by actually getting the parameters of the structural columns. Now to do this, we're in the Revit shelf. We'll open up elements and we'll go down to element. In here, you can see that we have get parameter value by name. So here we can feed in our elements. And now we're going to give the parameter name that holds that particular material. So this is held as a string. So we can just double click to make a code block. And in here, we can type in the uh, string that's required. Now, I'll just remind myself of what this is called. So I'll select the column. And here it's simply structural material. Okay, so we'll type that in. We have to make sure that we match cases and obviously don't make any spelling errors, otherwise that won't work. And you can now see we have our materials. Now, what it's done here is it's actually found the physical material itself. What I want to do is actually get the name of that material. And that's a, another property here called element name. Now, if we just scroll down the list here, we can see in Dynamo that we've got the strike of red lightning, which is performing an action on something. If we come down to the blue question mark, this is asking it some information. So one of the bits of information we can ask is what is the name of the element? So let's do this. 
And now this should give us the name in English or um, actual uh, readable language of what the material is called. And you can see all of these are in situ concrete, which is good. Now, obviously, what I want to do here is just check this. And if anything isn't in situ concrete, I want it to be removed from the list. Now, just so we can actually see this work in practice, I'll select this column here and I'll actually change the material type. So perhaps I'll pick lightweight concrete. OK, so now if we go back into Dynamo and we scroll down through the list here, we can see that one of those columns is in fact changed. And obviously our intention here is to remove that. So we're going to actually filter it. So to do this, we want to see if the string contains the phrase in situ. So to do this, we're going to come away from the Revit shelf and we're going to go into strings. So to do this, we'll collapse the Revit shelf. We'll open up string. And here we want to inspect the strings and we just want to see if it contains a phrase. So we can now feed our strings in. We want to search for a particular term and in my case it's in situ but of course if you're in the United States of America you might refer to this as cast in place concrete but again it's the same thing you just type in cast in place there instead. And of course now we can see that we have booleans representing whether that contains in situ and what we should actually notice is everything is good up until we get to 26 and that throws a false. So what we can now do is we can filter the selection of these elements here based on these booleans and that's something called filter boolean mask. Now to do this I'm just going to search for this I'll right mouse click in the background of Dynamo and simply type in the word filter. And you can see the very first option here is filter by Boolean mask. So what we can do here is now feed the masks in. And now we can pass across the list that we want to filter. And of course, that's the raw list up here of the actual elements themselves. So that goes in here. Okay, it's worth actually tidying up your Dynamo nodes as well. So we can actually read them nice and easily. And now, of course, if we look down through the list here, we can see that the in here contains all of the matches and the out is everything that we don't want the process. So we want to make sure that we grab the in list here. OK, so I'll just tidy up this by collapsing these nodes here. So this one is basically getting all of our structural columns. So we'll group that. And in here we can say and we can name this get all structural columns. with in situ concrete. OK. OK, so that's done. So we now need to do a very similar thing with our floors. And of course, we can just kind of steal some of the nodes that we've already used up here. So I want to get the parameter name uh, for, for the material here. Now, you may remember that this was a type parameter, not an instance parameter. So what that means now is we'll pass in the elements. And the first thing we've got to get is the type. OK, so we can just simply make a code block here, uh, put in type. And now, of course, if we run that, you'll now see that we have all of our uh, types in there. Now we can actually get that type parameter. And again, just to remind me of what that was, I'll select the floor slab. Like so uh, we'll go to edit type and you can see here again, this is called structural material. So. To, to action this, we can just simply copy this one again over here. And of course, I can also copy the code block because that contains the right string that we want to use in here. So we'll wire that into the parameter name. The elements, of course, will come from this node here. And now you can see that we've got the materials once again. To convert the materials into an actual name, again, we can just use element name. So once again here, we'll just uh, make a copy of this. Remember, to make a copy, you select the node, hold the control key down, and you can then simply just drag it. OK, so that will now get the element names. Good. OK, now we can use exactly the same logic over here. So once again, I'll make a window selection of those, and I'll copy those across. OK, so what's going to now happen is they're the strings that we want to check that they contain. And the list that we're filtering is the list of floors this time. So it's almost identical. The only difference is that the 
uh, structural material was actually held as a type parameter and not an instance parameter. But of course, out the back of this, you can now see that we have all of those elements that match our criteria. Now, of course, if you wanted to go a bit further, you could do that. You know, you might also have a comment uh, that says it's an in situ member rather than just the material. So you can kind of build on that and actually uh, make that whatever you want. So once again here, just to tidy it up a bit, a bit here, I'll just collapse the data previews. We'll put these into a group. Okay, and here, I'll just copy this uh, phrase up here and we'll paste that in here. And of course, we can just type in floors instead of columns in this example. Okay, good. So there are our two um, blocks of code ready to go. So let's now have a look at some methods of actually joining the concrete elements together. Okay, so we'll go to the Revit shelf, we'll go to Elements, and we'll go to Element. And the first thing I want to do here is check that these are in fact joined to each other. Now by default, the columns and the floor should be joined and the floor will always take priority by default. So let's just check that, we'll go to R joined, and you can see we've got quite a few new nodes in here. So if you've uh, come from Revit 2020 or Revit 2021, you may not see some of these nodes. So quite a lot of these, uh, these joining ones here for the in situ concrete material uh, were new. Okay, so let's just check this. So we'll put in the in list into element and the other one over here. And now if we evaluate these, we can actually see in this case that two elements aren't actually joined in my case. Okay, now what that will be is if we came round to, uh, to here, for example, we can see that this particular column is of a different material. Okay, so I'm gonna change that back to in situ. So again, you can see my code's now working and it's saying, well, look, if it's not in situ, don't incorporate that into the join. Okay, so we can see that those elements aren't joined. But what about if I now just want to go ahead and join all of those elements? Well, we can see here that we have join geometry. So let's use this one. Exactly the same set of inputs in here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to temporarily freeze this. That will just stop this one calculating. And then what we'll do is we'll put in the in list into these elements here. And we'll run this again. And you can see I'm in automatic run. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put that into manual here. Uh, just so I can decide when this executes. Okay, so I can now see all those are joined. But in fact, what we need to do is you can see here, it's only gone ahead and joined 22 objects. Well, what we need to do is we need to do this for the cross product. So I want it to evaluate the cross product of all of these elements. What does that actually mean? Well, it will take one column here and make sure it's joined to all of those floors. The next column, join it to all of those floors and so on. That's the cross product. To initiate the cross product, I can right mouse click over the element join geometry node. I can go to lacing and I can set that to cross product. So let's now run this again. And you can see it takes a little bit longer now because it's evaluating lots more objects. If we go back into the display here, we can see straight away that that column's now uh, actually joined in. And you can see, you know, all of those elements are nicely joined together. So, you know, that's really neat, very fast and efficient way of actually joining those elements. And of course, you know, if I wanted to check that here, I could now unfreeze that one, freeze this one off because I don't want it to join again. If I run that again in here, we can now see that we've got a board of trues in there. So that's all good. Okay, so what about if we wanted to now unjoin all of the geometry? Well, once again here, you can see that I've got unjoin geometry. Now I could either do it um, manually or I could just use this automatic um, method here to unjoin everything. So let's just put in one of these uh, lists here. So I'm gonna unjoin all of the columns. If we run this, okay, we'll now uh, take a little look up here and we can now see that everything's been unjoined in that list. So now you'll see it's really nice and easy. I can now just go ahead and freeze this one. And of course, now I want to join the geometry again. So I'll um, freeze off this one in here and we'll just run that again. Okay, and now that should very quickly join all of those elements. And there we are. Now, as I've said, the thing that's gonna happen here is the floor slabs will take priority and it will actually split all of the columns. But what I might want here is I might want the columns to be continuous and for the columns to actually punch a hole through the slabs. 
So just to show you this, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and isolate all of the floor slabs. So we'll um, let's make a selection of all the floor slabs first. So we'll select all instances in that view. We'll go to the glasses here and we'll isolate those elements. And of course, we can clearly see that all those slabs are in a single piece. So what we're going to do now is take a look at writing some Python script to do this, OK, because we can't actually do this out of the box. Yeah, it won't actually work. So first thing we want to do is get a Python node. So we'll right mouse here and we'll just simply type in Python. OK, so there's our Python node. Now, what we're going to want are two inputs, just like these have here. We want uh, element set one and element set two. So what I'm going to do here is just click on the plus button just to get those two inputs in here. You'd also notice with this version of uh, Dynamo, we've actually got the option of using Python 3, which is really good. It's the full Python or just Iron Python. Now, for this tutorial, it won't really matter which one we use. Uh, but obviously, the benefit of using full Python is we have access to lots and lots of different libraries that Ein Python wouldn't necessarily have. Let's begin by double clicking into the Python script. Now as we do this we can see that we've got what we call boilerplate code. So the boilerplate code is really just to get us started. So you can see it's importing the system library through, it's reporting some runtime libraries and it's getting in proto geometry which is for Dynamo. And we've got a, a variable here called data entering node that equals the input and then we've got an output. Uh, what I'm going to do here, just delete all of that. So we'll get rid of all of that. And what we want to do is we want to be able to interact with the Revit API. Now, to understand that a bit better, we're going to take a look at a website called revitapidocs.com. OK, so here we are in revitapidocs.com. And essentially, if we want to check that Revit can automate a particular task, this will be the place to come. So in here, I want to see if we can switch join order. So I can just start to type stuff in here. So I've just typed in switch and straight away I can see that we've got switch join order method. Now essentially the method is what we want. This is the method to do the task. And if I take a look here, I can see that this is within this particular class. So if we look up here, we've got a class, which is basically like a group of things. And you can see here, I've got join geometry utilities class, and that itself lives under Revit database. OK, good. So I can see we can actually do this task. And in fact, to do this, we'll need to actually uh, issue the command switch join order. It's going to expect the active document in here, the first element to switch the join order on and the second element. OK, we also now need to get our boilerplate code that will let us interact with Revit. So once again here, you can see that I've now got the uh, Dynamo Primer open in here. And you can see here I've got the boilerplate uh, setup code. Uh, this is in my blog post. So if you want to know the exact web location, you can just go and view the blog post. There's a link in the uh, description of this YouTube video. But essentially here, you can see that we have our boilerplate code. And if you want to learn a bit more about what the boilerplate code is actually doing, you can see that we've got an annotated version in here. And these are just remarks in Python, so this won't actually affect the code, but it just explains what each part does. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, select all of this and copy that to the clipboard. We'll then go back to our Python node and we'll paste that in. OK, so of course, I can uh, just run that nice and easily in there. Nothing will actually happen because we haven't put anything in. But you can see there's no errors within that. Essentially, what this is doing is it's actually allowing us to reference the Revit nodes, the Revit services, the API and so on. There's probably more than we need in here, but this will be a really good bit of boilerplate code for any kind of interaction you want to make with Revit. And you can see here that we've got a number of other bits of boilerplate code that are actually getting the uh, active document in here, the active application, and so on. Now, the first thing I want to do here is deal with getting lists uh, created within Python. OK, so here we'll begin by actually creating our inputs. So let's begin by creating a variable. And here I'd like to call this one first element list. Okay, and that's going to be equal to in zero. Now you'll notice here, essentially what that is doing is that's now saying whatever goes in here, 
store it in this variable okay now these elements coming in here are raw Revit elements and Dynamo kind of uh, treats these slightly different to what we'd actually need if we were using Python so what we need to do here is unwrap the elements coming in so what we have to do is type in unwrap element like that and then we have to enclose the in square bracket zero into uh, brackets okay so I now need to do exactly the same thing for the uh, second input. So I'll just copy and paste that to save a bit of typing. And this will be second element list. And of course, we'll unwrap in uh, everything in, in one. And if I run that, you can now see there's no errors. That's all good. OK, at this point, we can actually put in the, uh, the data that we want to see. So we want to take the in list, same as we've been using uh, for these default nodes, into zero here and the in list here into in one run that again and you'll see there's still no problems notice we've got null for the output because obviously we haven't done anything yet okay so the next thing to uh, realize with what's actually happening here is we're going to be making some modifications to elements within the revit database to do this successfully, we have to be in a transaction. Okay, so what happens is we make a transaction into the database, those elements are changed, and then we leave the transaction. So you can only do one thing at a time, essentially. So to do this, we type in transaction manager. Yeah. Okay, and you'll see uh, we've got capital T, capital N. Okay, uh, dot, and then we want instance. And then we want to ensure that we're in a transaction. So we'll type that in, ensure in transaction. And then in brackets, we're going to put in the doc. So doc, don't forget, is actually holding the current document in there. So that's going to now put us in the transaction, okay, or start that transaction up. So now we need to iterate through the list. Now, what we've actually got here is going to be a nested list because we've got one list coming in here and another list coming in here. So essentially what we need to do is iterate through a nested list. To do that, we can say for i in first element. So what does that mean? Well, what that's going to do is it's going to um, essentially now store each of those values in i okay so it's going to iterate through that list and store each of those uh, elements as i okay so when we do a for loop in python we need to put in a uh, colon in there and then we need to have an indent now we're going to do the second nested list so we'll say in here for j in second element list now again to save a bit of typing and save any sort of errors that might happen when you're typing we can uh, just copy and paste that through in there and again that will end with a colon and of course we need to do another tab now to indent that list and now we can actually perform the method that we're after so this is going to start with autodesk dot and now you can see we've got access to revit uh, then we'll say dot again and in here, what we're looking for is the database. You may remember it was under DB. So we'll just type that in, in there, and then dot. Now, this might take a few seconds to come up because clearly there's probably a lot of classes under the Revit database. Okay, so in here now, we can go ahead and find that. So we can say join, um, and you can see here that we've got join geometry utilities. And then finding in here, we can say dot again. And of course, what we want to do here is switch join order. So you can now see us accessing that API inside Revit. And that's what that boilerplate code has done for us. So you may remember that the method was to actually get the active document. And then we want the first element to join, which is going to be stored in I. Yeah, because we've obviously got I there. And then J. And then we'll close the bracket. OK, so once we've done that, we have to then close down the transaction. So we, we want to basically get rid of all of the, the uh, indentations back there. So we've actually finished the loop now. And again, we want to do um, transaction manager instance. So we'll make a copy of that and we'll paste that in there. And now we want to say transaction task done. 
Okay, so again, we can just type this in. Okay, and then open and close bracket. Okay, so that should be it. So let's just check that. So we'll click on run. And you can see here we have no errors. And of course, the way to check this is if we now have a look at our slabs, we can now see that they're all penetrated with those columns. Of course, if I hit run again, then that will reverse the join order. And of course, each time I hit run, you can see it will either um, switch the join order or not. Um, if we want to see that without the uh, temporary hide on, we can just reset that in there. Okay, so that's what it looks like at the minute. And of course, if I hit run, it's doing it now, but of course you can't see it as well. Um, you know, if I select one of these slabs, you can now see the columns are broken. So let's now run that again. Okay, and then we'll pick on that. And you can now see the slab is cut around all the columns. So there we are. You can now see that we have some really useful Dynamo nodes, uh, out of the box ones that we can use. And you've learned a little bit about how we can actually use Python with the Revit API, again, to automate some of these mundane tasks. Hope you found that useful and speak to you soon.